Right, today we have two short sutras, page 1, page 4. 1, page 4, chapter 12, and then we'll go on to chapter 13. Chapter 12 is on the Dena Binda Sutta, the lump of froth is called. So the very famous uh, reflection. And then the, actually the first, the first one is, uh, sorry, it's not, actually it's, Chapter 10, chapter 10, the Shatta Sutta is uh, Kanda Aditta Sutta. We we'll begin with the Shatta one, page 168. Sutta Discovery, volume 17, chapter 10. Now, once you look at this Kanda Aditta, Aditta Sutta, you are reminded of another more famous Sutta. Huh? Now, once again, why do we study Suttas? That these two suttas are reflective suttas. To reflect means to, to show the truth again. It's like a mirror. No? You stand before the mirror, the mirror reflects what is before it. So when you reflect, you also try to recall the teachings of the Buddha. But then why do we do that? Because we want to experience the same peace that the Buddha himself experienced. What was, what's so great about this peace? Because in this kind of peace comes wisdom. And when peace and wisdom comes together, then you get a very clear mind. And that solves a lot of problems. And also keeps our mind and body happy, basically. Yeah? In Singapore today, you see there are so many courses on psychology going on. Yeah? All kinds of courses. And uh, it's really it's really good and helpful to study psychology. But there's one group of psychologists that call the CBT, eh? and this is not criminal breach of trust. Eh? <laughs> this is uh, cognitive behavior therapy. <laughs> cognitive behavior therapy. But this this uh, name is very interesting see? because uh, you see there is a new trend in psychology now. Eh? Uh, this psychologist is the third generation, you know, mind you, it's so, been so, a long time, over 100 years. And uh, these people, they're saying, they're the scientists who say that the, the mind comes from the brain, they're not right. Uh, this is a big thing, you know, it's like saying Einstein and Newton are wrong. You know? But these are scientists themselves. They say, you know, you, you can't locate the mind in the brain. When I read this, I was very happy. Because this is what the Buddha also said. The Buddha said you can't locate the mind anywhere. The mind is not in, not just the brain, it's the whole body. And it's your loving kindness, you extend your mind as far as you can, the whole universe. Here. So the mind is not limited to the brain. In fact, this new group of scientists, they're called parapsychologists, they even they, they say we should see the brain like a kind of filter rather than the source of the mind. Do they have ideas like that? Of course, this is something very new. So it seems, actually, if we really study the history of Buddhist psychology, which began modern Buddhist psychology, yeah, which, which starts around, say, uh, over 100 years ago, uh, we have William James and William Kuhn in, in the German, William, William James is in the US, they were talking around about the same thing. So in a sense, uh, this modern group of, uh, this fourth wave, wave of psychologists, we like, they're going back to where William James left off. But what's so great about William James and company? Uh, the late, uh, what you call, 19th century. Because they had this great idea about Buddhism and psychology, but they did not have the tools we have today, like MRI, fMRI, all those machines to scan the brain. They don't have those things. So it was only theory. Then later, they were, you know, the scientists are just talking at the with each other. That's all theory. They don't have the machines to measure what's going on in the head and meditate or when you're thinking. So they were replaced by this new school of psychology called behaviorism. Behaviorism means they say forget about the mind. You can't see the mind, you can't measure the mind, no consciousness, forget about it. This new group of people. Eh? They say, look at your human behavior. Eh? You can condition human behavior, you can control human behavior, that's good enough. We make people do what we want them to do. Oh, the politicians and the governments and the business people love this. Uh, it's in advertisement, things like that. You know? Behaviorism became very popular. And then for like 50 years, behaviorism was very popular, 1900 to 1950, more or less. 
And then the, the people said that the thinkers that are looking at it say, wow, we have reasons that we don't exploit the team, you know, we will simply make people do things. And then they started thinking again, uh, we got to bring in the mind. Okay, now so to cut a long story short, the behaviorism, now you have cognitive in front of so Cognitive means something to do with consciousness. So they find that it is more effective to combine our understanding of the mind as well as human behavior, conduct. In fact, in Buddhism is very important to us. Because when you talk about behaviorism, we're not talking about the first training, sila sikha, right? And then the cognitive training is the second training, training of the mind. So you can see the Buddha was really well ahead of his time, 2,100 years ago. He was talking about training of body and speech behaviorism, training of the mind, cognitive therapy. So now these modern scientists have combined cognitive behavior therapy. And this is the most popular family of psychotherapy available today. And of all these groups, there's one interesting group called ACT. Oh, they have this uh, saying, you know, if you say it is ACT, that means you never know, you don't know this thing at all. You must probably as X, because the founder said you less the way you should pronounce it. X, spelled A-C-T, and uh, accept, it means acceptance and, uh, what's the second one? Acceptance. And commitment, commitment. therapy. Okay? In other words, you accept yourself and then you commit yourself to train. But when you read these people who are actually behind this act therapy, they're talking Buddhism. In fact, I just finished a 40-page paper last week comparing Buddhism and act. And I tell you, we talk. It's so easy to write because they talk a lot about Buddhism. My point here is, we find now this the really active kind of uh, psychotherapies, they're turning to Buddhism. I don't know if this, if, if this temple brings up a bit of psychotherapy to Buddhism, I can lock to a cup. This is something to think about. <laughs> so, this, uh, they talk about meditation, they talk about mindfulness, they talk about the nature of the behavior and so on, everything using Buddhist teachings. Of course, they do it. I admit that they're using Buddhism. So here, in other words, the Buddhism is a very precious teaching to us. It's all there about the mind. Mental health. All right? Of course, the psychotherapist is to them when they need something new, it helps them to earn a living, it's very important to them, definitely. And it's a very effective way of solving problems. So this is some for, for Buddhism, of course, this has been there throughout our training and practice as Buddhists. Right? So one of the most important things in Buddhist training, of course, is this mind center. Your mind, you use it or you lose it. So the, the mind is something we must constantly use. You can see, you know, many of our leaders, they, are, they live very long, I mean, Singapore, you have a very long lifespan, and we want this quality in life. That means the mind must be active right to the end. And you see the great minds like Albert Einstein and this uh, Russell, the, their minds are active right to the last moment. And for as, as Buddhists, it's important to us because when we pass away, the mind must be calm and clear. That will bring us to a happy rebirth, the next round, so to speak. Yeah? So this idea of keeping the mind fresh and happy and active is a very important thing, even though the body may not be so strong. The body is physical, so it's like that. But remember, we have these greatest scientists today. Stephen Hawking, look at his body all crumpled up, but his mind is really great. So the best way to keep our mind active is through meditation. You don't have to sit hours, you don't even have to get jhanas, but the idea is able to calm your mind in the present moment, whatever is happening before you, be there. That is very important teaching in Buddhism, present moment awareness. One interesting point that is the uh, act acceptance, commitment therapy, we like to say, is that most, if not all our problems, are language-based. It's the words we use in our head telling us, yeah, I'm like this, I'm like that, and then we listen to this voice and then we believe it is true. So we are limited by what we tell ourselves. And we create problems of what we tell ourselves. So in this kind of therapy, they tell you, don't listen to this voice. 
look at the real situation and examine it and work from that. Very good to see. Right? So what is this real situation before us? We have two sutras today, which uh, give us an example here. Right? So in other words, as Buddhists, what we're doing is we are all the time keeping in touch with reality. Keeping in touch with reality. We are reminded with very deep reality. We are looking beyond, underneath the surface. Now once you see underneath the surface, then you are able to understand what you are looking at the surface. You won't be cheated by it. You won't be uh, hoodwinked by it, as we say. So you know reality, then you are better prepared. You will not feel discouraged when failure comes. In fact, you begin to understand failure is how we define it. And we learn more from failure than we do from success. Because failure and suffering, the first noble truth is telling us that we have something more to learn. And then the hippo part tells us how to learn it, the two trainings. It's all there. So let's look at this first time. Very short one, page 169. Look at the title, Kanda. Kanda means the aggregate. Kanda city means actually a piece of log, you know, or even a pile of logs. Aggregate, a group. Adita means burning. Adita, in Sanskrit, Aditya is a popular Indian name. It's another word for the sun. Here it means burning, Aditya, and then Sutta means spread of teaching and the Dharma from the Buddha's time. And look at the reference number as 22.61. That's the number. You either remember the number or the Sutta for easy reference. Okay, page 169. Exavati. Like here, in the Sangita series, you find the Ewang Mesutang Gasevaka is only mentioned right at the beginning of the chapter. After that, they don't mention it anymore because they list all the suttas according to groups, according to ideas. Okay, so here the idea is that on Kanda, aggregates, right? So, but it's just mentioned here this teaching was given at Savati. This famous town where the Buddha, outside which the Buddha lived. Yeah? There the Blessed One said, with shoes, form is burning, feeling is burning, perception is burning, formations are burning, consciousness is burning. That's what the Buddha said up to this point. Yeah? Now you know very well that the second discourse of the Buddha is also called the Adita Ariyaya Sutta, the discourse on the burning. And then the Buddha gave more details. Right? Here, nothing is explained. Why burning? Because it's assumed that we all know the earlier Sutta. Right? Yeah? So, burning with what? So remember in the Book of Two, Ambutra Nikaya, the Book of Two, two things, the Buddha says when you look at the Sutta, you must always examine what level of language is the Sutta talking. Is it story language or dharma language? To use very simple terms. Eh? Or we say nitata, uh, that means the meaning has been brought out, that means explicit teaching, direct teaching, like impermanence, non self, using direct teachings. Or neyata, the meaning must be t star, we've got to interpret it. The meaning must be brought up, in other words, using stories. For example, the Buddha said once there was this monkey that did this and did that. The Buddha is not talking about monkeys. There's a story. Something happened. And what's the meaning of the story? So you have to tease out the meaning. So this is what gives the Buddhism the tolerance and the openness. Right? For example, as Buddhists, we can say, you know, there are Buddhists today, very intelligent teachers in the West especially. They, they really love Buddhism, they have been monks before and things like that. Then they left the order, they got married, and then they set up, they used their house, nice bungalow in the countryside, uh, to, to teach people. And this same person will say, oh, you know, uh, I've studied Buddhism, but I don't think I can accept karma and rebirth. Wow, I mean, you don't hear something in traditional Buddhism. I mean, the Sutta says, the right view means you've got to believe karma and rebirth. But here, in this language, say, no, I can't accept this yet because I have no way of proving it. Uh, you see, nobody's going to punish this guy. Nobody's going to tie him up and burn him at the stakes. That's the great thing about Buddhism. You, know? you, can, you can, in a sense, sensibly object whatever you like, with good reason. 
what he's trying to say is I can't prove this thing. So my acceptance is provisional. And this is very important to understand the word provisional. Whatever we know, all our understanding are provisional. You know, we hear teacher after teacher, speaker after speaker, so many ideas about Buddhism. Sometimes they seem to contradict. Sometimes they seem to be different from what we understand. That's the way things are. Because we are listening to views, opinions. So if we understand, we tell ourselves, all these are provisional. Provisional means we use it for the time being. Then we are okay. In fact, as long as we are not enlightened, everything is provisional. But once you understand the Dharma, then your, the pieces fit in. Then your mind becomes clear. Then you let go of the whole idea and you go up higher. Imagine, studying Buddhism is like climbing a ladder. You are on the ground level, you want to go to the top of the roof or you want to go higher up. So as you step on the ladder, you must firmly place your foot on each rung. In order to go up, the other foot must let go of the previous rung. So in a sense, we let go of old ideas. And then we understand new ones. And then we understand something even better. And then we let go of the new ideas. We go up. Up, up like that. This is something natural. You look at ourselves, you know. I look at myself for the last 40, 50 years. I've changed so many opinions about Buddhism. Each time getting clearer and better and simpler. So as we grow older, we find Buddhism can be simpler for us. Simpler in practice, but in theory, it gets more and more profound. And you get less and less words for it as your understanding becomes better. So that's how we progress as Buddhists. Yeah? We let go of more and more views. In the end, we are at peace with ourselves. Like meditation, you know, if you don't let go of views, you can meditate. When you come out to the, come back to the world, yes, we use views again. Right? So that's called provision. The views are provision. That is how we allow different opinions to coexist. Yeah? So what is this fire here burning? I mean, is it form is burning? Our body is form, but nothing is burning. Well, it's not that kind of fire. It is a higher kind of fire. This, this one is called uh, intentional language. It refers to the Buddha's intention of pointing to a higher, deeper teaching, burning with greed, hate, delusion. Now, once you have this kind of habit of looking at things deeper, something will change in you, I guarantee it. It happens to Angulimala, it happened to Kisagotami. The Buddha just said a few words and then something clicked in them. In the case of Angulimala, only one word, and that word is stop. You see, Angulimala was going to kill the Buddha, and then uh, he couldn't go near the Buddha. And then he shouted the Buddha, stop. Why are you running so fast? I can't catch up with you. It was kind of. It's very strange that this monk can move so fast and he's this serial killer, a very strong, tough guy. You know? He has killed 999 people and yet this very peaceful monk is way ahead of him. You can never catch up with him. So he shout to the Buddha, stop. Then the Buddha stop, turn around and gently tells Angulimala, you, Angulimala, should stop. I have stopped. And suddenly Angulimala got surprised, you know, he got a shock, he got like, uh, the, the carpet has been pulled under his feet, as we say. He says, this is strange, you know, these Nisakya holy men, uh, they are known to tell the truth. How come this, this strange teacher is saying one thing, meaning another thing, I don't understand. So they ask, what do you mean, you know? And what the Buddha said next brought stream winning to a Buddha Can you imagine in one uh, session of Dharma in the jungle, not in a nice temple like this, not in the city, in the jungle. The Buddha just says, stop. Then the Buddha explained to Gurimana, he says, Gurimana, you are still, you are killing and killing and killing. You are not, you are not stopping. But I am at peace with myself. I have stopped killing. That's the meaning of stop. Because to us, we are not Gulimala, so no special meaning. I don't care anyone got stream meaning here. Right? But he got stream meaning on the spot because he realized, yes, I've been doing the wrong thing, killing people, I should stop. Then he tells the Buddha, you know, 
actually I've been thinking, I remember you all this while, but somehow because of all these bad things going around me, I cannot reach out to you. Right? So this means even in the worst kind of people, do they have goodness inside? That is why you, know, you find many of these prison ministry, Buddhist prison ministry, they call it Angulipala. This gives all those people in the prison hope to change themselves. Even Angulimala as a serial killer can change. They can change too. Because why they see the truth deep within them. So this is how the Buddha raises our consciousness from an ordinary level to a higher, more noble, clearer level. Right? So here you see the Buddha say, form is burning. So he's saying his body is burning with greed, hate, illusion. This body is suffering with pain, burning with pain. Right? We have a fever, we lost. That runs real physical burning. But there's another kind of burning where even if we are healthy, we feel something is wrong, for example. Right? The mind is suffering. Feeling is burning. Feeling, when it is rooted in greed, hate, illusion, we suffer. Perception, how we recognize things, is burning with greed, hate, illusion. Formations are burning with greed, hate, and delusion. Formations is of your karma. Consciousness is burning with greed, hate, delusion. How we sense things around us can also be deluded in this way. But the Buddha, in his there, continues and says, Seeing thus pictures, the learned noble disciple is reviled or disillusioned with form, with feeling, with perception, with formation, with consciousness. Now, this word reviled is very strong. It means you have to be very careful. Now the Buddha didn't say all these things are bad, they just say you have to be careful with them. Right? It's okay if you have a body, but if you use your body wisely, then it becomes a vehicle for awakening, to become Buddha, for example. If you use your consciousness, the senses, like now this in the Dharma, wisdom rises. Okay? So the noble disciple let go of the, these five aggregates, as they are called. By letting go means you let them be as they are, so that they serve their purpose properly in bringing us awakening. Through revolution, it becomes dispassionate. So when you begin to understand the nature of the body, that is impermanent and so on, then you are not attached to it. You see it as it is. Through this passion, his mind is free. The mind is joyful. You know, in the mind, the mind can only be joyful when it is freed. In other words, nothing holds it down, like a bird. You, know, you tie a stick with a bird, the bird won't be happy, so you cut a stick. The bird flies happily. When it is free, there arises the knowledge, free the mind. You know it, I am free, I am happy. He understands, destroy his birth. The holy life has been lived. What needs to be done has been done. There is no more of this state of being. No more suffering afterwards. He lives happily. So there's a very short sutta, no? and it's time to expand it to the second discourse of the Buddha. Any question on this? This will show you how sometimes the suttas can uh, relate to each other. No? So from this short one, you have a longer one. <laughs>